the title of this talk is the legal aspects of the Kids of North Bergen program. But I'm not an attorney, so I'm I'm going to speak about legal aspects from the point of view of a clinician. I wrote uh, reports on um, victims of the kids program, and um, my reports were used as background uh, for uh, the attorney Phil Elbert, who's the individual who um, helped the, the people uh, who were bringing the suit against this organization. The legal strategy I'll, I'll just mention uh, that Phil adopted was that he did not involve himself in defining this group as a cult because his strategy was that if you do that then you get caught up when what's a cult where is, does something stop being a legitimate organization start being a cult and it's a red herring it, it, you get you get bogged down in that, which of course is part of the strategy of uh, the defense. So Phil never mentioned the word cult, but in New Jersey, uh, jury members can uh, send questions up for the attorneys. And uh, some of the jury members said, well, when you're talking about this cult, and I mean, they, in other words, they, they got it. They understood what was going on here. But that's the legal strategy. And, and again, it, it's, it's not my, my field. Um, but what I do want to discuss is the three case studies uh, that I wrote uh, uh, reports on, as well as the over a dozen uh, former members of this uh, organization, I should say probably former victims of this organization, who are members of the group that Lauren and I run. The um, The way that um, Phil uh, Elberg won the case was actually to sue the psychiatrists who uh, sold their signatures um, for the treatment plans for this organization. And when I say they sold their signatures, they literally sold their signatures. The, the, the uh, staff of the program had a stamp that they would use for the uh, psychiatrist's signature. Uh, the, the psychiatrists used, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna start that sentence again. The organization used pseudo-psychiatric terms in order to justify the incarceration of these um, victims in the program. Uh, the psychiatrists who I, I can't imagine that they would have actually reviewed these treatment plans because they would have picked up on what I picked up on in, in my report. As an example, one of the case records that I wrote about, uh, the reason that was used to deny this adolescent victim the right to an education, to privileges, to reading material, uh, was the pseudo-diagnosis of, quote, codependency, parentheses, father alcoholic, out of control behavior, unquote. That was the pseudo diagnosis that was used to deprive this individual of liberty and an education. And that this is over a psychiatrist's signature. This is over a psychiatrist's signature. Can I, the psychiatrist's name? Uh, I, I don't know it offhand. And, okay. um, uh, uh, the, the pseudo diagnosis appears nowhere. It's not in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, fifth edition. It, it's it's it, it's an absurdity, and it's it it it's such a vague term that um, you can use it to uh, uh, incarcerate just about anyone, which is exactly what this group did. The um, uh, um, the excuse for uh, incarcerating people into this program was that they exhibited druggy behavior. Again, uh, 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 druggy behavior is not um, a, uh, a diagnosis. And again, it's a term that's so vague that it can be used to encompass just about anything. Uh, one of the individuals that, that I wrote a report on, 
her druggy behavior was that she was 13 years old and told her mother that she wanted to wear her tail, her hair in the, in the tail, you know, a rat's tail. Um, this, this mildly rebellious, age appropriate behavior for a 13 year old was, um, was uh, grounds to keep her incarcerated without real education or freedom for 12 years. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Kids of Bergen County, later called Kids of North Jersey, was a pseudo therapeutic community near my home in New Jersey from 1984 to 1998. 18 years, its director was a man named Miller Newton. 1979, Newton's son developed a drug pro problem and was enrolled in Straight Incorporated. And uh, later uh, today, you're gonna to hear a victim of Straight Incorporated uh, speak about her um, experiences. Four months after enrolling his son, Newton joined Straight Inc. in St. Petersburg as an assistant director. And three years later, he was promoted to the position of national director of Straight Incorporated. Um, and uh, that became his, uh, his reason for uh, living. He founded Kids of North Bergen in 1984 make your own literary allusion to that. <laughs> um, the stated purpose of kids was to rehabilitate adolescents and young adults who displayed supposedly addictive behaviors. Addictive behaviors were defined by the program as just about anything from hard drug use to overeating to having sexual thoughts, teenagers, uh, other example of addictive behavior that I found in the uh, records that I read, only for the three people that I wrote reports on. I, I, again, there were hundreds of kids that passed through this program and were victimized by it. I only read the reports of the three that I was um, uh, writing a report on. Their behavior was being sullen, being sassy to the parents, listening to rock music, uh, getting a tattoo, or a boy wearing an earring. These were the, the behaviors that were uh, uh, assumed to be druggy behaviors and resulted in the loss of freedom and the loss of education for the, the victims. Once they were imprisoned by the kids program, the victims had to spend their time and energy conferring about their problem. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The only thing that they could talk about was how bad they had been. Uh, it was real and imagined sins that they committed. They had to write daily inventories of their past uh, sins, uh, that, that is past druggy behavior. Um, and when these inventories were deemed to be sufficiently um, uh, 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 lurid, uh, so that the staff found them to be acceptable, uh, they would be promoted instead of being called a newcomer, they would become an old comer, and then they would be responsible for taking care of several newcomers. And if they did a good enough job as an old comer, they could be promoted to staff. Um, therefore, the uh, criterion to be used for a person being promoted to staff was not credentials, was not supervised uh, a, a therapy, was not showing any kind of real uh, knowledge about addictions. Uh, the, um, the only criterion was that they stopped fighting against the injustices, the lack of freedom, and the lack of education, and the physical torture in the program. I'll get to the physical torture in a minute. When they agreed to abandon any semblance of control over their own lives, their own histories, and indeed their own thoughts, they could be promoted to be an old comer, and then they would police the newcomers to make sure that they conform. The physical, emotional, spiritual well-being 
of the children in this program was in the hands of other children who had drunk the Kool-Aid of the program. If they did well at this task, they might be asked to be on staff. I just put it in. Is that paid staff? Yeah, they were paid. Um, actually, some of them were paid staff, and some of them were um, paying back the program because um, once once you, uh, you you buy into the system, um, then you're so grateful that the system saved you. What they would be told was that if it weren't for us, you would be either in a mental hospital, in prison, or dead. And although that's absurd, of course, um, for, because you wanted to wear your hair on the, on the DA, um, you know, if you've got somebody telling you this 24 seven, it's the only way that you can advance in the program to earn privileges was to say that you bought the system. And if you uh, told the lies that all the people that I interviewed um, uh, said that they told, then your, your standard of what's real and what's unreal can, can become very distorted as you can well imagine. Um, rules included the following prohibitions. There could be no talking amongst the inmates of the kids' program except to confess past druggy behavior. 24-7 telling what sins you've committed. No talking amongst themselves. Um, after the confessions were read out loud or written and handed into the staff, the staff, who again were older children with no training in mental health or addictions, would determine whether the confessions were sufficiently lurid to be deemed acceptable. If they weren't, they were deemed to be bullshit. And if you were guilty of bullshit, then you were demoted back to the first phase of the treatment and you were denied all the privileges. So every single person that uh, I worked with that uh, was uh, in this program said they made up, they just confabulated things because if they made it uh, uh, disgusting enough or terrible enough, then they could win some small privilege. Um, these privileges included being able to go to the bathroom without somebody belt looping you. Belt looping you is when they walk closely enough to you to keep their finger in the belt, belt loop. Even to go to the bathroom, you weren't allowed alone in the first phase. Or you could earn the privilege of speaking with your parents for five minutes in a scripted talk in which the only thing acceptable was to say how grateful you were that uh, your parents put you into this program and uh, to tell your parents about all the horrible things that you have done. Again, um, some real but most confabulated. Um, so what's the age range, Steve? Uh, I'm going to talk about that a little bit more, but um, I'm, I'm not sure. The, the inmates themselves, the, the uh, people incarcerated, were from young teenagers on. The siblings, and I'm going to speak about that, would have to be involved in sibling groups uh, from eight, the, year, the age eight on. Um, Parents, when they spoke to their uh, kids in, in the program, were forewarned that their drug addict children would lie to them because they wanted to use drugs. So they might say that we're cruel here, that we physically abuse them, and that they, they're not learning anything and that they made stuff up. Don't believe it, parents. It's druggy behavior. The more they tell you this, the more sure you are that you did the right thing by putting people, your, your kids in, in the program. The, the analogy um, to those of us that are familiar with other cultic groups is to first generation uh, people and second generation. The first generation people in, in the kids program were the parents. They, they bought it. Um, they bought it because they were told, they were convinced that their kids were going to end up on the streets or in a mental hospital or in a jail and that they had to be tough. The parents had to um, abide by all the same rules that I mentioned before. No talking amongst themselves. They called it uh, a 
parking lot gossip, no parking lot gossip, no shopping for staff. If, if you believe that a staff member did something inappropriate or unhelpful to your kid, uh, you had to talk to that person about it. You couldn't go to another staff member to say, hey, this thing just took place. It was a perfect closed system. The only way, as I said, to advance in the program was to tell a lie, which was called telling the truth. The way to be demoted was to tell the truth, which would be deemed telling a lie. If you have a system or a government in which people are rewarded for lying, you have a very terrible situation, whether it's a Chinese doctor who, who uh, had to sign a confessional for blowing the whistle on, on a, a deadly virus, or I just would say, thank God we don't live in a country in which people are punished for telling the truth. You can, you can file that under <laughs> S for sarcasm. The enemy in, uh, in, in the, the kids program was so-called druggy behavior. Uh, this morning I mentioned the philosopher Eric Hoffer who wrote the book The True Believer which is an assigned reading for everyone watching this video or hearing it say, read Eric Hoffer, The True Believer. Among the um, insights Hoffer had, he said that a mass movement can exist without a God, but it can't exist without a devil. And every mass movement has to have something, some horrible, awful being, entity, or thing that they are constantly on uh, alert about, and that can be used to justify any behavior. The young adults uh, with a program with whom I've worked have told me that they lied in order to get small uh, uh, advantages that I, that I mentioned to you. One said that he had sex with his little sister. One said that she had sex with a dog. One said that he took money from his mother's uh, purse. All of these confessions were lies. Of course, after several years of their lies, truth becomes a lie and lie becomes a truth. And you lose track. I mean, just think of it. Years of this kind of behavior. If a victim of the program had a natural response of becoming furious and wanting to bolt or denouncing the injustice or, or screaming, let me out of here, they would be um, held down in four-point restraint, one sitting on one arm, one sitting on the other, one on the leg, one on the leg, and one on the chest, and with their hand over their mouth like this, pressing tight, um, and uh, uh, several of the kids that I worked with told me that when this would happen to them, which would be until they stopped struggling, they, they had difficulty breathing. It was torture. Because the children in the program were not allowed to express any anger or resentment towards their prisoners, and, and of course I'm, I'm going to tell you that anger and resentment is part of adolescence towards people in authority and it's part of all of our relationships no matter all of our intimate relationships we get mad at the people that we love and that's natural it's, it's it's natural to feel ambivalent towards the people that you're close to and it's natural even with uh, somebody who's a mentor to say i'll follow this person's advice in this area but you know, not to, to deify them when they're deified that's a problem and i have patients who, who um, say to me, as on occasion I have, um, gee, you really have your act together. You, you, you let me know what you're doing. I said, no, 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 please. That's not the case. I don't choose to parade in front of you my insecurities and my problems because that wouldn't be appropriate. That's not what we're here for. My 
what I have learned to do is to help you to come up with your own conclusions. But please don't think that it's because um, I've got my act together in every area. It's absolutely not true. I don't want to be deified. I don't want to be idealized. That's not helpful for you. But again, because the kids in the, in the, the children in the kids program were not allowed to express anger or resentment towards their leaders, these, this anger and resentment and hostility came out towards the newcomers that they were in charge of. So they would be deliberately cruel and uh, sadistic under the guise of helping them. I am helping you to get rid of your druggy behavior by physically torturing you. I'm doing you a tremendous favor. So they were given a, um, a pseudo explanation for getting out their hostility that they weren't able to get out in, in healthy ways. It wasn't only the children who were inmates of uh, the kids who were victimized. Parents and siblings also had to write out their own inventories nightly for the scrutiny of the staff. Again, other children. Adults had to write out inventories of their own druggy behavior for children to read and to determine whether they were being honest or not. And the siblings and, and parents had to attend public meetings every uh, Tuesday and Friday evening, as well as any other time that the, uh, ch their child or sibling was going to make a public confession. During their meet these meetings, there would be no unscripted interchange, no private conversation, no what they called eye games. In other words, you know, hi to, to your friend. When Vanessa came in earlier this morning, we winked at each other because we didn't want to interrupt everybody. But that was an exchange that said, I, I care for you. Can't do that. Can't do that to your child. And no eye games. What would happen in these uh, public uh, meetings is the kids member would stand up with their family in the audience, tell their family, I love you. Thank you for putting me in this program. I did these things. I, I screwed a dog. Uh, <laughs> and the, the only thing that the, the, the uh, audience members could do would be to clap. It was bad enough that the children in the program had to be involved and that their parents had to be involved, but so did every sibling over eight years old. So siblings over eight had to give up their Friday nights and Tuesday nights when they had homework or friends or television or anything, normal things that kids want to do in order to come to the program. They weren't allowed to have friends that hadn't been approved by the program members. Um, so naturally, a resentment grew um, against the kids that were, that were in the program and against the program itself. Um, and that resentment would be interpreted, you guessed it, as druggy behavior. If a sibling started to express anger or resentment, or even to defend their brother or sister, that was druggy behavior, and they're moved into the program. All of the three people who, uh, who I did reports on had older siblings that had been in the program, and they got sucked in. It was um, commonplace. It, it, in fact, I, I would say it was more unusual that if there was a sibling, um, that that person would not become part of this, the, the, uh, the kids' program. Uh, Miller Newton and his staff would convince the parents um, that uh, the, the sibling was on their way to druggy behavior. They had already, again, drunk the Kool-Aid that, that their, the kids that they put in um, were, were going to end up in the gutter. And now, God forbid, their child, their other child, is going to end up that way too. After um, a day of being in the program, the kids would go home to a, um, um, I think what they call them, a 
parent house. And I can't remember. But, but what would happen is um, there would be an old comer with six newcomers and they would sleep in uh, sleeping bags in the bedroom with a locked door. Um, so the parents um, were also uh, uh, constantly brought into this 24 seven. Individuals who were liberated from the program, as you can imagine, suffered and continue to suffer after effects. When they first come out, there's confusion as to what's truth and what's not. Um, I, I'm thinking of one uh, individual that I worked with whose mother woke up before she did and she got her out. This young woman who um, fought not to go into the program and, and now sees it, as you can imagine, as the worst uh, 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 years of her life, um, refused to leave when the mother came there with a lawyer saying, I want my daughter out. Um, luckily, she prevailed and, and the girl got out. But you know, if, if you buy into a, even an absurd system, and the only way of, uh, of getting privileges is to continue to buy into that system, then you lose track of what's real and what's not. Bill, what was the criteria for successfully graduating? Uh, they had to go through three, um, uh, a series of three steps. The first step was the 24-7 boot bootstrapping. Um, then they would be permitted to have uh, relationships um, with other people. And third, the third uh, part of the program was that they were permitted to go to a local Christian school but they were not allowed to interact with any of the other kids. So they'd be the new kid in the class. And, and, the, and the, the school knew these kids, they'd be there for a month or two at the most, and then they'd be demoted again. They'd be there in the school, and the other kids would come up and say, hi, I'm so-and-so, and they were gone. They're not allowed to, because if you interact with somebody on the outside, you could be, uh, um, uh, sucked in to druggy behavior again. Uh, after they went through the third session, then some of them could be graduated. Um, but what, what happened um, in, in most instances was that they were constantly being demoted and starting over again at, at phase one. Um, if the kids ran away, um, the other uh, kids in, in the program, if the children ran away, I should say the other kid, the people in the kids' program would form a posse to go out and find them, grab them off the street, shove them into a, 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 a car, and bring them back to the program where they would be put in four-point restraints and they would have to admit that they, the only reason they left was because they wanted to use drugs again. Um, other, other problems um, of people that were in this program is uh, universally the graduates um, had difficulty trusting, um, as, as well you can imagine. Um, many of them suffer physical disabilities because of the restraints that they were put in and because of the after effects of what was called motivating. In order to earn um, uh, uh, points, credits, in order to, to be able to have the, these, these privileges, um, the kids would have to be called upon in a program, in, in a, um, an, a um, auditorium, which is where they spend their time um, like 18 hours a day. And, and they talk about the blue seats. The, the blue seats were, you know, the, the plastic chairs that they'd have to sit in. In order to get to earn points, you had to be um, called upon by the, the whoever was leading the group. And what they would do in order to be called upon, um, they would not raise their hands. They would have to be in the seat. Hmm. And they'd have to go like this. And then somebody would be called, somebody else would be called upon, and they would sit there. If they nodded off, they would be 
jabbed if they got up and said, um, I really never use drugs, they would be forcibly pushed down into the chair. Think of yourself constantly agitating like this 18 hours a day for weeks before you'd be called on. And a lot of them suffered physical disabilities because of that. Um, I think the speaker you're going to hear a little later will be discussing uh, that for her. So there's long-term psychological, physical, and emotional um, uh, problems that occurred because of their uh, uh, involvement with this group. Some of those who left were reunited with their families and their families came to recognize um, that, that they had been led astray, that, that, that they were uh, uh, fooled by Miller Newton and his staff. Um, and as I said, they were like first generation cult members. Others never, um, the other parents, families, never accepted that and um, went to their, their graves <clears throat> refusing to speak to the, uh, the uh, uh, child that left the program, um, even though obviously it was a good, healthy, self-sustaining move for them to leave the program. Um, some of the parents said, I'm really sorry, I made the best decision that I could make under the um, situation with the information that I had, and it was wrong information. Other parents just never accepted it and would never have anything to do with kids that left. So we have some time for comments and questions. Um, sorry if I missed it, but what was the length of the program from when they first entered? Because obviously some would get demoted and they have to go through the steps again. What was that? I guess maybe the average? Yeah, I, I, I can't answer what the average was. It was supposed to be anywhere from three months to two years. That was what it, they said in their literature, but it was always, always more than that. Yeah. Uh, the, the, I, again, the only way that, that you could um, uh, uh, survive in this program was to, um, to just completely lose yourself. Your, your sense of yourself. Um, and the healthier kids were the ones that, that would rebel against it, and then they would be thrown back into the, the first phase. Right. Oh, what was the funding for the program? Who paid for it? Well, that's, that's, how, they, that's how they got caught, because um, uh, a lot of the funding came from Medicaid, and um, the, the suits were for Medicaid fraud, and and they were proven. Uh, they lost their license. I I, I didn't because I just didn't want to take the time. Didn't mention that Miller Newton had started two other programs. One in Florida, one I think in Utah. Um, got lost their funding there, and then started one in uh, in New Jersey. And I would like to say I would like to tell you that um, he learned his lesson and sure. isn't doing it again. But that would be a lie. He's in Florida now. Um, he's become a, uh, a minister um, and uh, continues with, um, I don't know if he has a program, but he continues to counsel. Oh, he does have a program. Um, An Orthodox uh, church. Yeah, it's an it's a offshoot. It, it looks like, like Greek Orthodox. Right, right. But it's, and he's a priest in it. Right. right. But, well, at least now he has God on his side. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But he, but he does this with adults, so couples, that could be 40. I, you probably answered the question when you mentioned Medicaid, but um, I, I'm sorry I missed the first few minutes of presentation, so you might have gone into this earlier. But who, how did they get into the program? Did the parents voluntarily enter them because they're problem kids? I mean, if it's Medicaid, they have to go through the process of, you know, what, so. Anyway. Yeah, it, well, what, what would happen is um, it, it was during the time of the so-called tough love movement in which parents were being um, encouraged for a, a child that was out of control to um, 
you know, just kick them out of the house, throw a bucket of water on them, whatever. Um, there, there, there were some um, real professionals who meant well who advocated for this. But as you can imagine, in any punitive program, it can so quickly turn on a dime into, into a, a program like this. And that's, that's what happened here. Um, they were um, uh, funded by uh, Medicaid and by, and, and, and the beginning received um, certification from the state until they were exposed. Um, and again, they had psychiatrists who were uh, signing off on supposed treatment plans. When something would happen, I, I, I read the reports of the three um, uh, victims whose, whose uh, reports I read, there, there was page after page of an incident report in which um, uh, he or she showed unruly behavior, <coughs> druggy behavior, um, didn't accept the rules of the program. The, the kids that, the children that, that wrote these knew how, what the words were that they were supposed to say. Um, when I asked the individuals involved what happened, they said, no, I, I would just say, I want to talk to my mom. Um, or um, I, when I told when I told you I, um, I was stealing money from my mother, it was a lie, it wasn't true. And of course, that, that they would be shown their the confession they had been forced to read. Um, so they, they went through the motions of um, having real treatment plan, giving <coughs> real treatment. Um, and it wasn't until they were um, they were sued and all this came out in court that it was exposed. So the children diversified. Yes, yes, they were diversified by race, by age, by next, not by age. They were all um, uh, adolescents and young adults. Um, for the most part, by um, by class, there were a few wealthy kids who, whose parents paid their way, um, but it, it was not monochromatic or, or mono uh, classic. All well, genders, male, female, <coughs> both. So once the kids were eighteen, they were free to go in essence by right. Did they? They didn't realize that they were free to go. Mm -hmm. Partially because they were told, no, you're not free to go. You are a drug addict. You are here. You are stuck with us until you uh, learn your lesson. And only those that were had the, the um, uh, I was going to say only those that recognized that that wasn't true. That, but to my knowledge, I don't remember hearing about anybody that said, uh, I'm signing myself out. Right. Um, what happened was they 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 believed that they were that this was going to be their fate for the rest of their lives. Um, I, I mentioned the mother who uh, got her lawyer um, to come and demand that that the program give up her daughter. Um, the the, the pro when when she first said I want my daughter back, the program said no. You signed the paper saying that we were responsible for her. And we're not going to, to get her back to you. And that's why she had to bring her lawyer. Yeah. yeah. Were they responsible for any of the labor maintenance of the grounds, like gardening, cleaning? Did they have to do that kind of task? The, the, the program kids in uh, Burden County was in an old warehouse. So it was, it was a stark cement uh, room with high ceilings. So there was no, very little, uh, Maintenance. They did, they didn't do that kind so of force. So it was relatively cheap to run. Oh yeah, 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 sure. Just curious, what town was this in? Uh, Paramus, New Jersey. Uh, and so this wasn't was court ordered. Or... Sometimes, sometimes it was court ordered. Sometimes, oh, yeah, I, I, I should, I should just remind you that what happened is it would start out with kids that were that parents deemed to be out of control but mushroom because then all their siblings would be brought in and the kids that were <coughs> deemed to be out of control may have had some behavioral issues 
issues that could have been worked on by a, a legitimate therapeutic community, with, but the siblings um, had nothing. The, the young woman that I said was in for over 20 years, um, had, she had a supposed eating disorder because she was overweight. <coughs> oh, oh, and also because she confessed to um, liking one of the boys in the programs and therefore had sexual um, uh, addiction. So <coughs> the, the time period here was before a lot of new therapies came out, but were there kids that, that had like a attention deficit and or oh, absolutely. Asperger's that were thrown in here because of the behavior? Yes. Wow. And one of the individuals uh, uh, that I mentioned, I, I just, I didn't want to get into it. One of them uh, had borderline intellectual functioning yeah. that was not diagnosed. Mm -hmm. um, and just because it's, it's on the tape, I, I just didn't sure. want to go into that. But she didn't understand. She couldn't, she couldn't grasp. And what she would do <coughs> uh, would be to, to self-mutilate. She would bite her arm um, uh, because of her frustration which of course was unacceptable attention getting uh, behavior. I mean, these people didn't know shit about what was really going on with the young people. And I said before, they were in the program because they were druggies and they were druggies because they were in the program. Mm -hmm. It was a perfect circular uh, uh, system. It almost sounds like a contained version of the final solution. Like yeah, this yeah, thing, yeah. You know, like right. we figured it out, this is what you do. Yeah, yeah. Get rid of these and and just as uh, the the inmates in the concentration camps would identify with the aggressor, um, some of the kids, you know, I said before, uh, drank the Kool-Aid. They they accepted that this was what that this group had saved their lives. Some of them said it um, without believing it. Some of them believed it and said it, and some of them claimed afterwards that they said it without believing it, but at the time they convinced themselves that it was true because that was the only way to, to survive. Um, it was, it was a, a, a perfect iatrogenic situation, in other words, where the cure causes the illness. Were there, um, were there uh, how many kids went through the program? I, I don't know. Um, Hundreds. I, I, I don't know. I don't have an answer for that. So, what was the results for the psychiatrists that were citing these erroneous treatment? Um, well, by the time the, the soup was bought, was brought, um, they were dead. And really? uh, I, I, I shouldn't have left. I don't know why I did that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Probably because you're glad you're dead. I'm going to say that again. By the time the suit was brought, they were deceased, but their um, um, insurance companies were sued, and the insurance sure. companies um, oh. paid up. And I don't call me on this because I, I might be wrong, but I believe at the time that it was the largest payout for any individual in a situation like this in the history of New Jersey. That wouldn't have been surprising. Medicaid also got involved. Um, oh, Medicaid did. And Medicaid sued um, yeah. Miller Newton and sued the psychiatrist. And Miller Newton declared personal bankruptcy. But uh, it came back uh, in another guise. Right, right. Yeah. right, right. There was never any he criminal... was beatified and came yeah. back as. And there were any criminal charges against him brought by. No, uh, to my knowledge, there were no criminal charges. Brought. What do you they should have been. Yeah. Um, what you, before, before his son, um, wasn't kids already acting in another state? Wasn't it in El Paso first, or did it begin in New Jersey? No, no, no. It it, it began. Uh, it, uh, there may have been one in El Paso. I know there was one in Florida. Same piece. And I thought Utah. Maybe it was Texas. Maybe it was Oh, yeah. So yeah, the same the same program and Straight Incorporated, which was the parent right. company, was still going on strong and had a lot of political support. I I, I think your speaker later on will probably tell you more about that. Can you mention it though? Like, are you talking about milk uh, assembler? 
Yeah, I'm talking about mal similar, yeah. So what's the relationship between Strait and kids? Uh, uh, Miller Newton was hired by Strait and became part of their program and became their, check my notes. Um, director. Yeah, yeah. And then split off from it to form uh, kids. So it was the parent company. Uh, so do you think he continued to kick up to Strait? I don't know. I don't know. That'd be interesting to know. Then. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. The program in Utah, I just looked it up because it was, I, I did run a belt. It was a wilderness therapy right. program where they would isolate the kids. Um, and sometimes, you know, the parents would trick them, drop them off. And right. They couldn't get home. It wasn't in a suburban area by any means. Um, and uh, there was like 86 deaths. Um, 86. Hold on. There was a lot, um, but it was <laughs> a confirmed count, whatever that means. But um, you know, the staff, their sexual assault, staff have uh, background checks. It was terrible. Um, did I send you an article? Yes. Yeah. I like, I like, I like yeah, the name, it's in the Atlantic. It's called, it's in the town of Enterprise. Red no. I, I'm I just, yeah. I personally am I'm pretty conservative in my psychotherapy um, practice. And I'm always concerned about some of these outliers, the, the, the transformational workshops that were talked about this morning, the, the ones that, that bring about instantaneous change and um, uh, where, where people throw out quick, quickly, you know, all their inhibitions and all. Uh, even if uh, under, under proper guidance, it can at times be helpful, it, can, it so quickly devolves. Uh, because once you give somebody control, and, and this was, was uh, mentioned this morning, once, once you give somebody control over other people, and they're convinced that they have the answer. They have the answer to problems. Um, then anyone that, that goes against them um, is, is evil, sinful, uh, anti-therapeutic, a traitor, um, you know, whatever, whatever the word is, depending on, on the ideology of the group. So, so the most important thing, to me, the most important single thing is the humility of recognizing that um, you know, none of us has the answers, but I'm going to speak in a, in a few minutes about choosing a psychotherapist. And one of the things that I'll tell you, I'll give you a preview, is um, if you have somebody that says, I can treat everybody and I can treat everything, and you treat them with the same treatment and run like hell, um, all of us should be humble and recognize where our limits are, what we're what we're good at, what we can uh, uh, provide, and, and what we're not good at, what, and when we have to refer to, to somebody else who's an expert in, in a different area. Um, would, again, probably because I missed the beginning, but did they live in this warehouse, or was there? They would, the, they, they would be in the, the warehouse during the daylight hours. Then they would go home to a host parent. That was the, what, what I was trying to remember there. It was a host parent's home. The host parent's home was one of the parents of one of the kids in the program. And somebody asked before about funding. This was one of the ways that they um, would, would be able to uh, uh, afford to have their kid in the program. Uh, in the host parent's home, they would be given, they were not allowed to talk to the parent. Um, the only people they could talk to were the old comers that were hurting them, um, and the parents uh, were um, given instructions, make it a homey atmosphere. I mean, talk about a contradictory <laughs> term. You're not allowed to talk to them, but make, it, make them feel at home. Um, so they would, they would um, uh, come to the host parents, be bused to the host parents' home, and they would uh, be given a meal, they would write their moral inventories and hand them in. Then they would have lights out in a, a 
bedroom uh, that was locked, um, and the old the uh, old comer would sleep across the door to make sure that they couldn't get out until they would get up in the morning uh, when they would be given breakfast and then bust back to the program. This was seven days a week. Um, the uh, old comers, um, if uh, they were late to a meeting, um, would be penalized, uh, set back in the program, one day for themselves, no, 10 days for themselves, and 10 days for every one of their newcomers that they were in charge of. So if you were late to coming to the meeting, you would have to spend 70 days back in, in phase one being belt looped. So naturally what was created was an atmosphere in which the old comer would say, I said, move your ass, get, over, get into that van. You know, it, it was the constant tension because they were all so afraid of the, um, the, the, the punitive uh, things that would happen to them if there was one slight mistake or error. So it, they were under constant um, uh, 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 tension when they were going to and from, they, the only, I'm gonna start this again. The only time they saw the outside world was going to and from the, um, the, the program to the host parents' home. And the outside world that I told you they saw, they weren't allowed to see. They weren't allowed to look out the window. They weren't allowed to read newspapers. They weren't allowed to watch television, read newspapers, uh, 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 listen to the radio. They weren't allowed to do anything except confess how terrible they were before they got into this program. So the, they had no educational subjects that were studied at all mm -hmm. in the school? Exactly. Except until they went, they got into um, phase three when they would go to that Christian uh, school in which they would sit like a month in the classroom, not interact with anybody for pain of being uh, ratted out and sent back to phase so, one. So there had to be a conspiracy with the Christian school. I mean, they had to notice that these kids were acting oddly, you'd think. Yes, <laughs> yes. I. I, I, I and this knew guy, nothing about the Christian school other than what I told you. And when I did my research in preparation for this, I couldn't find anything about any kind of um, uh, retributions from the state education system to this school that was just as guilty of seeing these atrocities and not speaking mm -hmm. up. I'm curious, um, from the parents, from the host parents' perspective, you know, surely there was host parents who were just like, this is terrible, but yet they almost had fallen in line too because they thought that maybe it would work for their kid or, you know, what was their, what was the aftermath for these host parents? Um, what kind of reflections, I guess, did they have? Yeah, well, uh, let me say, let me say first, um, actually, in terms of, of how the parents felt, the, the parents were the first line in the cult. Okay. They were sold the bill of goods. Okay. It, they would have parent meetings. You know, yeah. So think of it, you get up at five o'clock in the morning to make sure your kids get off, your, your, the kids that you're in charge of, get off to the program. Then you gotta get your other kids in school, in school or wherever. Then you have to go to where, then you have to, you, you go to the parking lot. I'm, I'm telling you the story that one of the parents that I interviewed told me. You go to the parking lot, you sleep for an hour, um, and then you go to work. Then you come home, you prepare a meal for the, the, the kids. And then if it's one of the two days a week that there would be big meetings, you schlep the kids all back to the, to the program where you sit in the audience, making no eye contact, not having anything to do with your kids, uh, other than hearing your kids say, mom, I love you, thank you for putting me in the program. And you'd say, love ya. I mean, I mean I, I'm, I'm doing it as if it, it, it's humorous. And it's not, it's horrific, it's awful. Um, so the parents bought it too. The parents were um, told no, again, no eye games, no um, uh, parking lot gossip, no shopping of staff. So the only things that the parents heard were, thank you for putting me in this program, mom, I'm so grateful. Um, these are the terrible things I did. They never heard, and, and they never were allowed to talk to other parents that 
that would tell them there's something wrong here. Um, and if they had thoughts about pulling their kids out or something like that, the other parents would congregate and berate them. You're killing your child. Don't you realize you're killing your child? And in, those, in these kinds of, of situations, um, uh, in, in these closed systems, you, you, um, the imperative is that you show how um, deeply committed you are to the group. You know, in, in, in some of the um, uh, cults where people would be put on the hot seat, the other members would be the strongest ones to denounce them because what's happening is saying, the spotlight is not on me. As long as I keep the spotlight on Joe, I'm not going to be, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 berated. And then nobody is suspicious of you. So the parents bought into the whole thing. Um, <clears throat> the only contact that I've had with, with um, parents of organizations like this, where uh, Lauren and I twice hosted meetings of parents who had kids in cults, not only this kind of program, um, and um, they, were, they were super guilty. Um, and if we had the time, we, it's a need, we should have, we should have continued. But the only reason we did this is that we just didn't have the, the time because of all that we did. So, so yeah, they, they come out of it feeling either, either very guilty, which are the ones I saw, or justifying their behavior, Something. who didn't come to yeah. the group. Were there any escapees? Oh, yeah. If, if somebody would leave, um, uh, uh, the, the group would uh, form a posse to go in after them, grab them, and bring them back to the, to the program. If they left and called their parents, their parents would uh, turn them in as long as the parents weren't part of, of the movement, which most of them were. Um, the, uh, so no su 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 successful escape. Okay, there were some. There was a young woman, um, Phil Elberg tells a, 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 a very funny story. He, Phil Elberg was the attorney I mentioned in the very beginning. Um, he won a, a multi-million dollar case against this group. Before that happened, this one young woman escaped the group, called her grandmother, because she was smart enough to know not to call her mother, and her grandmother said, come and stay with me and I'll take care of you. And uh, no, nobody knows. One day, the grandmother read a um, newspaper article about the uh, case that, I hope I'm telling this right. Phil isn't here to tell it. This is how I heard what he said. Um, so everybody that Phil worked with that came out of the group said, um, if you get a call from so and so, help her. She is the worst. She got it the worst. She had. She was constantly under uh, a, a five point restraint. Um, and um, Phil had told his staff, "If you ever hear from so and so, let me know." So Grandma reads this article, says to the her granddaughter, maybe this man can help you. So granddaughter calls Phil's office and says, um, you know, may I speak to Phil Albert? I'm sorry, he's in conference. And she says, okay, would you please tell him that so-and-so called? And Phil says, his secretary says, don't move. Stay on the phone. Do not hang up. I will be right back. Runs into the conference room and says, Come out here, and, and that was that was one of the. Okay. Well, um, thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you.